Jim, in addition, or, or as a part of this display here at Gunsight, you've got what I'm going to call sort of the evolution of the U.S. Army pistol. It is that exactly, uh -huh. and of course that uh, uh, in many ways cumul accumulates with the uh, 1911. Absolutely. That started way back, uh, uh, of course the earliest guns were the single shot flint locks and uh, right. uh, percussion pistols, but you get up to the Civil War era, you're looking mm -hmm. at the era of the percussion revolver. And right. Sam Colt, uh, the man who uh, uh, solved the question of the repeating firearm with the introduction of re the revolver, and always looking for more firepower. Sure, and, sure. Uh, and uh, uh, we have here a Colt Navy model. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular one was made in the uh, mid-1850s. It's based on the 1851 uh, Navy model. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to get more, uh, more stop and power in a smaller package. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they introduced this as a 40 caliber model. This is serial number one of the uh, 40 caliber Colt Navy. It, uh, they only made about three of them, and uh, they went to a, a different concept to develop the uh, 1860 Army instead in 44 caliber. Sure. But this is uh, this is uh, experimental model out of the uh, out of the Colt factory. So then you're telling me that my my uh, 40 caliber auto is nothing new, right? You know that uh, <laughs> people keep wanting to split that difference between the 38 and the 44 or 45 caliber. Exactly. Happened with Colt back then. Uh, when the uh, uh, Colt auto pistol was first introduced and the Army won something bigger than their 38 auto, they did try an experimental 40 auto uh, at Colt uh, right around 1900. Yeah. So now, a, some of these I recognize. That's a Smith & Wesson American. It is. This is one of the 1,000 Smith & Wesson Americans that was purchased by the U.S. Army in 1871. Really the first cartridge uh, uh, revolver, first cartridge repeater that was adopted by the mm -hmm. U.S. military. And of course, the uh, classic from that era, from the Indian Wars era, would be the Colt Single Action Army. Now, this is. A, I believe I've seen one of you've those. You've seen a, a few of those. You're familiar with those. This is uh, an artillery model, the, mm -hmm. uh, the a so called artillery model. They were called in, refurbished, reconditioned. Barrel was shortened from seven and a half inches to, uh, to the uh, five, uh, and, five a half. and a half. Yeah. Yep. And uh, uh, reissued in that configuration. Mm -hmm. And at the same era they were being used, we had this gun too. A Schofield, Smith and Wesson. Smith and Wesson Schofield. Again, it's a top break revolver. Uh, 8,000 of these were in U.S. military service, uh, purchased between 1875 and 1878. Uh, very big in the Indian Wars era. And then uh, sold a surplus, uh, a number of them going to Wells Fargo. Yeah. Now this is Schofield serial number one. It's the first production model Schofield That's made. Great. You'd think the factory would hang on to something like that. You do. Well, you know, and, and uh, Jesse James, that was one of his favorite it guns was, was the it Schofield. Was. It was. It uh, was very popular in the West. Absolutely. A lot faster reload than the Colt. Yeah. Uh, not quite as sturdy. Jesse James was known to have a Schofield. Virgil Earp, Wyatt's brother, was known to favor the uh, 44 American. Absolutely. Absolutely. But then we get on into the double actions. That's that's a well. The army thought they were on to, to a modern concept here. They were going to go yeah. with uh, the uh, swing out cylinder starting in 1889 and through the 1890s. The uh, uh, army adopted a number of swing out cylinder classic double action revolvers as we know them today, mm -hmm. uh, chambered for the uh, essentially the 38 Colt cartridge, which right. was like a very mild 38 special. Right. It seemed like a great idea at the time. But they ran into some fellas in the Philippines that uh, uh, gave them a little different some, idea. Some little fellas some that, little, just, little that fellas. just weren't impressed yeah, with that yeah. cartridge. Yeah, they'd, uh, right. they'd absorb six or 12 of them and still go on and do some damage. So yeah. uh, the Army rethought that and thought uh, maybe we need a bigger caliber again. There you go. Now here's something. Win a lot of bets on this one. A lot of people will tell you they've never seen a Luger with a grip safety. but. NRA yeah. Museum's got one. Yeah, absolutely, it? that's one of the uh, one of the early ones. This is the model 1900, mm -hmm. and of course the one we're all familiar with is the 09. Sure. This 1900 was being adopted in uh, Europe. Uh, American military took a hard look at it. They ordered mm -hmm. 1,000 of these to issue to military units for a field trial. And this is one of those 1,000. It's got the American Eagle on the chamber here, mm -hmm. and it was used in those field tests in the 1901-1902 era as America started looking at a semi-automatic instead mm -hmm. of a uh, uh, revolver for their yeah. service sidearm. 30 Luger, right? It's 30, 30 Luger. Luger cartridge. Yes, sir. Yes, right. sir. They tried them in both 30 and 9 millimeter. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Philippines and the Thompson-Lagarde tests 
convinced the services that they needed to go to a 45. Right. And so they, uh, they issued a call to uh, pistol manufacturers to submit uh, 45 caliber designs. Of course, the semi-automatic was a very new concept at the time. Right. There were a lot of fledgling firms out there. And uh, 1907, uh, a number of them responded to the call and submitted samples for the U.S. trials. And we're very fortunate to have some of those trial pistols on yeah. display. Now this one, I have to tell you, I've never seen a pistol like that before. You're going to have to tell me about that. I hadn't either. That's one of the 45s that were submitted for the trials. It's a Grant Hammond. It's a 45 caliber. I bet the lines look fairly uh, familiar to you. Kind of remind me of the high standard uh, That's it exactly. Pistols. The uh, yeah. high standard uh, uh, evolved from this. Mm -hmm. Now the military, eject, uh, the, the military rejected it uh, right out of hand right. because it dropped the magazine on the last round. That was a design feature yeah. of it, but the military was not impressed with that. Not so, a good uh, tactical no. move. No, no, <laughs> it was no. A, it was a non-starter with the military. Yeah. And this pistol is, we'll call that the second place winner. It is the second place winner. It came down to these two pistols right here, the Savage Model 1907 and the Colt Model 1907. They were the uh, winners of those 1907 trials and the Army said uh, uh, each firm to make them 200. They'd issue them to troops in the field, see how they did under actual service conditions. And uh, these are the models that they, uh, that they selected. Now the Savage, a very new firm, just starting up. Mm -hmm. This is a, a 45 ACP Savage. Uh, probably only about 280 of those made. Yeah, uh, right. All went to the U.S. trials. And this is serial number one. This is the first one yeah. made. This Grant Hammond is serial number one, too. So uh, uh, it was out there. And then competing with it was the Colt Model 1907. The Army also bought 200 of these. This is a 45 caliber Colt, predecessor of the 1911. And uh, uh, they went out to field trials too. And those those years from 1908 to 1910, uh, there was a lot of intense development going on as problems were identified and changed, sure. and the modified designs were modified and modified again. Came to the pistol trials between these two, between the Colt and. Uh, uh, by then, the Colt was looking more like the class of 1911 mm -hmm. we know now. They had uh, uh, the model 1910. It looked very much like that. But that, uh, that uh, Colt and that Savage shot it out. 6,000 round test in uh, uh, 19, 1911. Uh, and uh, first 1,000 rounds, it was neck and neck. Neither one of them hiccuped. But in the last 5,000 rounds, the Colt just kept running. And the Savage had about 37, 38 malfunctions. So the uh, board recommended the Colt. You know, now I've heard this a story or a rumor, if you will, that the, when the Colt ran 6,000 rounds without a single malfunction, that that's the first time in military trials that that had ever occurred. They'd, uh, they'd, they'd as far as I know, there had never been an endurance test of that magnitude right. for, a, for right. a pistol. And, they've, and they'd never had a gun to that point. No. Run it completely. No. And all throughout this testing period from 1900 up to 1911 was a story of malfunction, breakage, and yeah. redesign. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, John Browning and Colt were exceptionally responsive in, uh, in meeting the needs, addressing each issue, uh, making the changes, both major and minor, that were needed to perfect the firearm. Yeah. The, the, the greatest fighting pistol the world's seen Today. Absolutely. Today. Absolutely. Thanks to you and the NRA Museum for making this happen and, and bringing these out for us to look at. Well, thanks to, to Gunsight for, uh, for having us here. That's great. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.